deep trance mediumship is a passion of mine, uh, which I don't know how much you know about that. It's where you kind of go into a deeper altered state. I know a little, but again, not not too much. Okay. Uh, quick overview for trance mediumship. There's a lot of what we call platform mediumships and readers. And platform mediumship is a little bit like uh, if I say to you, pitch your kitchen, you can see it in your mind. Mm. And if I say to you, hear one of your parents calling your name, you can hear it in your head, but it's not in your ears. Um, and most what I would call platform mediums or clairvoyants tend to work that way. They connect with their spirit guides and they get images and information come into their mind. Sometimes it's clairsentience, just a sense of knowing. Um, and sometimes rarely you'll get audio as well, but not many people have a direct chat going on in their heads. That's quite rare. Most people see images and get a sense of knowing um, to get the communication coming through. And you can ask questions and you'll get answers, but you may get them in pictorial form. And I've done a lot of that as well. And I still do a lot of that at spiritualist churches and various different community centers and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so does Carol, by the way. Yeah, she's uh, and the then, same. yeah, she's very good at that stuff. Um, and then trans mediumship uh, is where you go into a deeper altered state and you allow the spirit to draw much closer to you. Some people like to say they sit inside your body and you step aside and you let them take over and speak freely through your mouth, through your voice box. Um, and have you heard of ectoplasm? Yep. Mm -hmm. They build, they, or they can build an ectoplasmic mask over your face, which they can then control to change into their face. So you can start to see the spirit. And you work in a darkened room with dim red lights, typically. Um, the mediums of yesteryear used to work in the pitch black and create all sorts of effects, but that's open to a lot of trickery, of course. Yeah, I think, was it, wasn't it famous, was it Leonora Piper or someone who was um, accused of using, or they found out that she was using cheesecloth or something like that? But uh, there's been loads, yeah. And even modern day ones today I've been to see, I would not <laughs> hold my breath. Mm. I've not been impressed with most of them, to be honest with you. Um, but... Trans mediumship for me, I have a, a physical aspect to it. So my face will change into the spirit's face, which is very evidential when it's a relative. And a lot of trans mediums only tend to channel guides and talk philosophy. Um, whereas physical trans mediumship is objects moving in the room, spirit lights. Uh, we've had direct voice which is spirits talking out of thin air by making an ectoplasmic voice box. They'll build ectoplasm over my face and change my face into their face. And sometimes a series of faces one after another. Um, and I've even been levitated off the floor on one occasion. All of this I have recordings of that we record all the sessions because we have some amazing philosophy as well. Do you record these on video as well as audio? No, audio mainly. We've audio not mainly. really managed to get the camera systems right. Mm -hmm. Where you work in quite a darkened room, as soon as you start sticking infrared lights on, it tends to obliterate what's going on. Indeed. So you can't see the ectoplasm any longer because the infrared light's blasting out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, but we do need to do some experiments with that. And we've built a light box, trying different colored lights. Um, and we need to get apparently a zero lux camera, whatever one of those is don't know but it'd be certainly be interesting if you have been as you say levitated before to capture something like that on film would be yeah really interesting because it seems unfortunately that one reason that um physical mediumship is looked upon as as 100 percent fraudulent is because as you say it needs to be done in a dark place with no cameras and no recording equipment so it's seen that you know well that you can say whatever you like but if it's not on film there's no way you've yeah. proven it um which i think yeah uh, well issue with the uh with the skull experiments and things like that wasn't it yeah, well, the skull experiments, they invited the SPR and the, the, the right. physical research people, and they, they did record a lot of stuff on camera. And they the SPR brought in sealed camera film, mm -hmm. and the old-fashioned camera film in canisters, that they were sealed and signed with wax. Mm -hmm. And they took them away and developed the film and found all sorts of images had been placed on the film. Mm -hmm. So they did a lot of physical proof. Um, it and it's one of the things that 
it was still very much debunked, wasn't it? Or attempted to be by the James Randies and, and the folks alike. Yeah, you know, you can't convince the non-believers, can you? <laughs> that's always that's always been the game, unless they go and witness it for themselves. I've had many people come into my trance room um, frightened, very apprehensive about what's going to happen. Um, and they say that they, they it's, it's very palpable. You'll see videos on my website um, of people saying their experience of seeing their father or whatever. And more so than just the seeing is the feeling of pure love and things that come across, <clears throat> which makes it very genuine for them. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a funny old journey. So trans mediumship for me, I've been doing for sort of over 30 years and had some amazing experiences with that. Um, and then more recently, about five years ago, I was actually away on a retreat teaching mediumship. And the colleague I was doing it with said to me, do you know you've got this doctor following you around? And I said, yeah, I'm aware there's a guy following me around. And she said, well, I've been talking to him and this guy wants to work with you. He wants to use your physical energy to heal people. So my initial response was, is his sat nav broken? I don't do healing. <laughs> And she said, well, give it a go. What have you got to lose? Um, and so I did. I've tried it on the people on the retreat and they all seem to get magically mended. Aches and pains and knees and stomach problems and what have you. Um, and I came away very sceptical because, you know, when you're a tutor on a course, people obviously want to give you the correct answers. Yes, indeed. And you don't know how much kind of suggestion works into that exactly and psychosomatic and all that stuff so i came away quite cynical and i, I said to my spirit team come on and it, it, this is real what what do you expect me to do next uh and literally the next day a friend of mine in Cheltenham who teaches reiki um phoned me up and said what are you doing friday and i said well, not a lot why and she said well come down and do your reiki too free of charge you'll be doing me a favor so I said, really? How's, how's that doing you a favour if you're not making any money? And she said, because I've got an odd number of students and I need yeah. um, an even number to be able to teach. So I said, oh, okay. So I went along and I did the, the Reiki thing. And at the end, she said, right, I want you to go off now and do 15 hours practice to get your certificate. So I thought, okay, that's the answer to my question. Do some practice. So I threw it out on Facebook and um explained that you know i had this new spirit doctor and we're practicing and did anybody want to come along for some free healing and i got inundated with people and the first lady in came in with very high blood pressure um i can't remember that figure but it was very high like 190 over 130 Ooh, that is high and yeah something like that and she said can you heal that and i said i have absolutely no idea but we'll give it a go uh and at the end of the session it was completely normal and I said, well, don't get excited. You might all come back tomorrow. And a week later, she's still telling me it's completely normal. Hmm. Um, and then the next patient in that, alopecia, a 12-year-old boy. And um, he led on the table thing and went to sleep. And his mother said to me, blimey, he's also autistic. He normally hides in a cupboard if anybody touches him. And he's gone to sleep, so he's so relaxed. And my doctor said, two months, his hair will be back. And it was. I then got pictures from his mum showing a full head of hair. See, I, I could understand the, the blood pressure being suggestion and being kind of a placebo effect because we know that mentally, you know, our state of mind, our emotions, our, our minds can affect things like blood pressure and anxiety. I suffer with anxiety and depression and an irritable bowel, which is an absolute pain at the moment. But that can all be, you know, influenced by our mind. But something extremely physical like alopecia i can't i can't work on the theory that that would be psychosomatic accurately you know <laughs> and i've had lots more since i've had incurable things like tinnitus um i had a lady in cheltenham with drop head syndrome who's if you know what drop head syndrome is like your head's bent forward so you're looking at your feet right and your neck at 90 degrees um is that a spinal thing yeah, I'm not quite sure. I'm not at all medically trained, by the way, so I've no idea medically what these things are. I, I put my hands on the patient and my doctor, I asked my doctor to come in and do his thing. And he shows me images through my hands of what's going on and what he's doing to correct it. And 
he corrects it. So it took about an hour to have a neck straight again. Um, at which point the poor lady was crying and begging me not to leave because she had other things she wanted mended. <laughs> um, and I've had things like a, I did a load of experiments in distance healing mm -hmm. and uh, I had a lady who's a medically trained nurse contact me and ask if I could help her mother who was in hospital at the time with cataracts and glaucoma in both eyes. So she's basically blind. Yeah. And I said, okay, but you need to lie down quiet to receive the energy that I'm going to send um and i did the experiment with her and she said as soon as i started doing it her mother's eyes started watering and 20 minutes later she opened her eyes of clear vision so medical things i've had people with who've had eye operations and one of them's not quite right and blurry and my doctors fixed that um all sorts of stomach issues backs knees elbows arthritis in shoulders and knees people arrive on you know, walking sticks and crutches and yeah. leave crutches over the shoulder. So, I mean, that that's pretty that's pretty amazing, isn't it? especially for someone who has something like cataracts that's a, a layer of film across the eye. The suggestion and the placebo effect cannot <laughs> repair that, you know. Exactly. So the the 15 hours of practice for me, that, that was, I've told you a bit, a bit more of the longer term history, but 15 hours of practice for me proved to me that this was real. Mm. And not only that, he was diagnosing people um, as well, people come in and want to test me and they come in and I say, what do you want healing? They say, you tell me and touch wood, it's been a hundred percent correct ever yeah. since. And some of those people were medical professionals as well. Um, who've been quite blown away. One girl came in and she said, you tell me. So I put my hands on her shoulders, like Reiki style tuned into her energy. I said, okay, I'm drawn to your lower back. Can you lie on your front? put my hands on her lower spine. I said, okay, I'm seeing a vision of you being bucked off a horse and landing on your bottom. And she said, that's exactly what happened. And I broke my coccyx. Christ. So I'm getting, so I'm getting mediumistic information with the healing going on as well. Through you, so after through the doctor. 15 hours practice, it proved to me that this is real. So I said to my guides, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> How do I go forward? I can't just give up my day job. And, um, Again, two days later, uh, I had a website design company at the time. A lady walked in off the street and said, I'd like to speak to Peter. So I said, I went through to the meeting room. I said, yeah, how can I help you? She said, oh, I want a website. That's what you do here, isn't it? I said, yes. So we started talking about that. I said, what do you do? She said, I run a healing and meditation retreat in Nailsworth in Strag. And um, we started chatting and she suddenly turned to me. She said, you're very spiritual, Peter. So I said, how do you know? And she said, because I'm being told. So I said, oh, okay. So I told her then a little bit about the healing and what was going on. And she said, oh, that's why I'm here. I don't want a website. I said, really? What do you mean? And she said, I don't want a website. I was just driving past and I was told by spirit to come in and talk to Peter. Mm. And she said, now I know why I'm here. She said, come and start your healing practice at my retreat and I'll bring you loads of patients. Hmm. And she did. So, wow. and here we are. And here we are. So and lots of patients, yeah. people flying in from around the world, all sorts of things. Do a lot of distance healing. I did my own experiments with distance healing. I'm quite, I I'm, grew up as an engineer, very logical. Did mechanical engineering, did electrical, electronic engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, I, I like proof. I like cause and effect. Mm -hmm. I like to know what's happening. I'm into quantum physics. Mm -hmm. And entanglement theory says that everything was once connected before the Big Bang happened. Mm. Oh, and hence, way, no... everything still is connected, isn't it? Regardless of how far away. They Absolutely. Are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I read about this experiment in America where they had got a group of monks to sit down and meditate yes. and send their thoughts towards a, uh, what's it called? A random noise random generator. Noise, yeah. Have you heard that one that it spits out mm -hmm. on or off every second and over an hour at average 50 50 and they swang it significantly up to about 80 20 yeah. consistently that's right I've beyond probability so then they put two in the room mm. yeah mm. then they put two in the room to see if the effect would be diluted between them but it remains the same hence the infinite amount infinite amount of power source energy so then they took one of them and flew it to the other side of America and ran the same experiment to see if the distance made any 
palpable change and it didn't so having read that i thought so i do hands-on healing can i do the distance healing it should according to quantum physics be exactly the same so i put an experiment out again on facebook to say i was doing this trial and the only rules were i don't know you personally i don't know what's wrong with you and you fill in a feedback form so i could do some statistics at the end and that's all up on my website and um i had something i think it was 40 people sign up whilst i nipped to the shops <laughs> and i thought okay so i did it so i had to diagnose and then send the healing energy and the overall result was 79% of the people had an improvement in their condition. I think 7% were completely cured. And one of those had macular degeneration. Um, and very interestingly, one lady put forward her husband without telling me that, she, that it wasn't her mm. who'd signed up. She put her husband forward and he had no knowledge of what was happening. And he'd had, I think, a heart attack and a stroke. And he got depression and he just sat in a chair by the window for six months, just staring out the window. We hadn't moved. And immediately after the healing session, he got up, stretched and said, I feel completely different. I'm going out for a walk in the sunshine. <laughs> so no placebo effect going on. No, no. Was really the point. And it's kind of gone on from there, really. Um, I've had some quite amazing things happen to me over the years. I'll share a few of you if you like. Some of the more significant ones um, that show principles and show the power of the spirit world in action that I find quite amazing. Um, I'll start with the, what I call the Mitsubishi story. Uh, I went into my office one morning and started work and suddenly became 100% convinced I needed to buy a Mitsubishi Shogun. Mm -hmm. Just nice completely concept. randomly out of the blue. Which uh, I started looking on Auto Trader, and this metallic blue one's leaping off the page at me. That's the one I want. And so I thought, where is it? And I was in Gloucestershire at the time. Oh, ha hang on, it's in London. I was thinking, oh, damn, it's in London. And I thought, oh, hang on, I'm going to London in a few days' time on business. I wonder how close it is to where I'm going. Just around the corner, fantastic. So I phoned up, made an appointment, went around to see it. And as I got out of the car, reality started to dawn on me. And I thought, I've lost my mind. I've gone completely mental. I don't want a Mitsubishi Shogun. It's the last thing in the world I want. Big gas guzzling four before. Mm. I thought, I've, I've literally, like, I've gone mad. What? How, how am I here? What am I doing? And this lady had spotted me. She came out of the house, and she was on her way down the path saying hello. So I had to pretend to look around this car, thinking, what the hell is going on? I'm... I'm lost I'm the plot get it yeah no i'm definitely not buying it so i made some excuse like i've got a few more to see and um she said oh you've come all this way come and have a cup of tea before you go so i'm like yeah that'd be lovely and found myself sat in her kitchen having a cup of tea um very bewildered very confused lovely lovely lady her name was avril by the way so i sat there chatting with avril and all of a sudden this huge energy starts to build behind me and my arms started to hum and vibrate with the power and it was trying desperately to speak with this woman through me and it was all I could do to stop it and I thought I'm, this is going to get bad in a minute this lady's going to freak out and uh, I said to her look this is going to sound crazy I'm a, I'm a medium and I've got this tall blonde German man stood behind me who's desperate to speak with you, I can let him in or I can just go. I was expecting her to say go. And she said, let him in. I, I want to speak to him. So I relaxed and I let this energy move forwards into me and take over. And all I can remember is speaking fluent German. I was gone, completely out of it. When you do trance like that, it's a little bit like um, being sat in the kitchen and having the TV on in the front room. Mm -hmm. it's not your thoughts but you can hear yourself talking yeah. and could you just to confirm could you speak german at all no never no. <laughs> not a word um and all i can hear it was just german coming out of my mouth and the whole thing was over probably i don't know 30 seconds to a minute whatever 
and gone. And it went as quickly as it came and left me. I was shaking, sweating. I couldn't hold a cup of tea. I was like this. Sweat pouring off me with the heat and the energy that came in. And I looked up and this lady's crying her eyes out. And I thought, oh, God, what have I done? <laughs> so I said to her, I'm, I'm so sorry. And she looked up and her face lit up. Excuse me. Just one second. I didn't realize the phone was on. That's all right. It's not a problem. Turn it off. I didn't realize. Uh, I said to her, I'm so sorry. And she, she said, don't be sorry. She said, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And I said, what happened? And she said, well, let me tell you first. The reason I'm selling the car is the same reason I'm selling the house. Uh, she said, my husband's a vile pig of a man who's been beating me for years. And my boss said to me, if I pluck, pluck up the courage to leave him, then he'll make sure I'm okay and he'll look after me. She said, so I did. We had the big showdown. I've kicked him out. We're selling everything. And she said, and then my boss got diagnosed with cancer and died two weeks later. And that was him. He just came through to tell me he's still watching over me and everything's going to be okay. And she said, I can't tell you the relief. I've been so alone, mm. so desperately frightened. She said, that message for me has changed my life. So I drove home very bewildered. Without, not in the <laughs> exhibition. spirit orchestrated all those things mm, mm. Um, yeah. and coordinated all of that to deliver that message. And they convinced me I wanted to buy a Mitsubishi Shogun. <laughs> and you, you didn't end up walking There's away. There's a very <laughs> interesting... Sorry? And you didn't end up driving away in the Mitsubishi at the end of it. Definitely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, but it showed me the power. They changed my mind. They made convince me that I wanted to go and buy something to the point where you know, I got in the car and drove to London. Yeah, indeed. See... Do that. It's, it's, it's unusual how my mind probably works because most people would say, you know, that's amazing about the message and, you know, the fact that it was her, her boss, who I'm assuming was a tall, blonde German and all that sort of thing. And I think that's that's amazing. But to me, the most amazing thing is that you spoke fluent German, even though you can't speak a word of it normally. Because that, that to me, you know, is, I'm a scientific thinker and that to me is just impossible unless what you, you know, the experience is somewhat true. I assume she spoke German as well. Yes, she was German. Yeah, she was German. So see, to me, that is the most interesting thing because that shouldn't happen, you know. Yeah. How could that happen unless I was exactly. channeling? Someone who spoke fluent German. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's fascinating. I mean... That to me was the most natural bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing because these sorts of things I always believed were nonsense because I've been brought up to believe they were nonsense. You know, once you die, that's it. You're gone forever. There's no continuation of anything. There's no mediumship. It's all a fraud, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, since doing Seeking Eye and talking with people and going to some mediums myself, one medium brought my nan through and she said, yeah, she's got knobbly knuckles and likes to bake. Oh, right, great. You know, yeah, every, every that's all awesome, nan. Yeah. And that, that kind of dissuaded me a bit but then you know since talking to a few people and, and talking to carol having carol's reading it, it really does make you think you know christ how much do we not know and yet you know you have stories like yours like your mitsubishi like your other you know very strong evidential stories i mean treating alopecia and treating you know blindness and all that sort of thing just through spiritual healing some things that are impossible according to our medical understanding and our physical understanding of science and yet still it's it's not it's not taken seriously under the grounds that it's anecdotal. What, why do you think that is if these remarkable experiences happen and are undeniable? Well, it is changing. A lot of the NHS uh, hospitals are now actually employing Reiki people to come in as a, as a professional position within the hospital. Mm. So it is changing. People are becoming more aware. I mean, if you've had a car crash, you don't want a spiritual healer. <laughs> you need an ambulance. Yeah. You know, for acute injuries, you need an ambulance. You don't need a spiritual healer. But there's a lot of things that can be sorted out with spiritual healing. But healing doesn't work for everyone. You know, there are some people, and I'm not 100% sure why, um, the inclination that I've got from it is some people's paths, I believe, I believe everyone's path is predetermined. I believe major things in your life you make choices on before you come here from the spirit world. Mm -hmm. So some things can't be changed because they're part of your path that you've chosen. Um, and other times I think some people block energy with negativity. 
but my personal experience, the best healings I've done are the ones who are completely open. Mm -hmm. The ones who don't have any predetermined ideas. Um, and they're just open to see whatever happens, happens kind of thing. Yeah. The ones who come in and say, well, I don't think it's going to work and I don't believe in any of this stuff, but I'll give it a shot. Doesn't seem to work so well. So there's a lot of talk. I don't know if you've got, ever got into the laws of manifestation and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a whole interesting subject on it. Yes. So I've done a few experiments with that myself. I, you know, I've read a few of the books, you know, the ask and it shall be given by Jerry and Esther Hicks mm -hmm. and the secret and the cosmos. Course, and all course, kind of thing. David and all that sort of thing. Yeah, there's loads of them now, and they but they all they all say the same thing. There's a really good um video on YouTube as well called Down the Rabbit Hole, What the Beep Do We Know? And that kind of pulls all the concepts together. And the most important thing I think that most people miss is the fact it's about what you feel, not what you think. Because most people think the opposite of what they feel. So if they say, right, I'm gonna manifest a new car, so I need a new car. They're thinking, I want a new car, but what they're actually feeling is my car's rubbish. Yeah. And the universe doesn't go on what you think. It goes on what you're feeling. And that's that vibrational energy you're giving off. So it gives you yeah. back more of what you feel, not more of what you think. From what I gather, kind of the, the main way of manifesting is to, as you say, feel or live with the genuine feeling as if what you want has already taken place. Yes, and giving the gratitude for it. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Wasn't it... Um, a good friend of mine that I was telling Carol about as well was, was talking about the Chinese um, like medicineless hospitals where they they deal with manifestation and, and when someone comes with cancer, they say you know well they try and treat them by changing their mindset into living life as if the cancer is already gone, as if it's already you know receded, and I don't know if the accuracy of it, but it, it uh, allegedly has has worked on more than one occasion with no chemotherapy or radiotherapy involvement just through living with that manifestation. However, I imagine it must be difficult to really feel that with the fear of what cancer can do. Yeah, it's a bit of a reminder going on in the background, isn't it? Yeah. Have you watched the Dr. Joe Dispenza stuff? I've seen it, but I've never had the time to sit and actually watch it properly. Uh, okay, he did, he did a, a Netflix thing called Heal. And he had people there who were terminal with cancer and had hours to live. And one lady that sticks in my mind from the documentary, had, sorry, I digressed a little bit. I don't know if you know Joe, Dr. Joe Spencer. I think it was a skiing accident. He broke his back. And they said it was such a high-risk operation um, that he'd most likely end up in a wheelchair. So being a medical doctor himself, he decided that he would sit there and visualize each of the individual bones mending and many months in a hospital bed, but he completely cured himself hmm. um, with the power of the mind. So he then set about trying to make this into a more tangible methodology. So he set up all sorts of experiments, medical experiments, medically measured to look at the power of the mind. Things like um, it got two guys with a very similar build and they put one through a bodybuilding course, lifting the weights, and the other one had to lift invisible weights, but mentally feel like he was actually lifting the real weights. That's a good experiment, yeah. And they both gained the same muscle mass. <laughs> and he did another one with a keyboard recital for two guys who'd never played the keyboard before. Uh, I mean, you could argue one was more musically talented than the other, natural disposition, whatever, but neither of them had played the keyboard before. One played an actual keyboard and practised, and one had to practise mentally on an invisible keyboard. And then come the day, they both played exactly the same recital. Mm -hmm. so, so and he's done a lot of those type of experiments. So they were given the same piece of music to imagine, for, for one to actually play repeatedly and one to imagine. Yeah. And then they both okay. I don't know the finer details, yeah. but the outcome was that they both, one with a keyboard, one without a keyboard, managed to play properly mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and he's done a lot of the, that type of work, which I find quite fascinating. But this Heal documentary, um, there's a, there was a, one story on there where a woman had 
tumors, breast cancer, with tumors the size of lemons. And she was hours from death. And she had an out-of-body experience and met her spirit guides. This is on her deathbed in a hospital. And met her spirit guides who explained to her how she was manifesting her own illness and her own cancer through worry, through stress, through, you know, visualizing what was going to happen to her and all the rest of it. She came out of that coma and was cancer free within 30 days. Almost swore bloody hell. Yeah. So, and there was a lot of those type of stories showing the power of the mind to change the body. And that was, she wasn't, if she was terminal, I imagine they weren't kind of putting her on any chemotherapy or radiotherapy or anything. No, she, they, they were saying the goodbyes. Yeah. Christ. That, that Her was organs were crazy. shutting down and failing at yeah. the time. But I mean, to have, you know, tumours that large spontaneously re reset, you know, well, I can't yeah. remember the word, but completely to, disappear. To disappear. That, I mean, that must be like a one in a multi million chance to happen just off, off the cuff. Yeah. Oh, highly likely. I mean, I, I don't know statistics on it, yeah. but the point was, it was the power of the mind yeah. that healed her. Yeah. After that out of body experience. Yeah. And that self belief thing's very interesting. I mean, back to the laws of manifestation. Um, I've worked for quite a few different managing directors over the years, and they're all completely different to each other. Very successful people. And I tried to analyze what makes these people successful. And the one thing that united all of them was a hundred percent self belief. Mm even in the face of adversity, never a shadow of doubt that, that whatever they were doing wouldn't work. In incredible stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know someone that we would term an arrogant pig. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And everything yeah. goes right it's for them. Way. And they don't <laughs> care. And money just falls off trees in there. You know, they, they fell in the canal, they come out with a salmon in their pocket. Yeah. Those people... Um, just everything just falls at their feet. Every lucky break, money just comes to them. And then you meet other people who are the nicest, kindest people. Everything goes wrong and they get ill and they have disaster after disaster. And you say, how is this fair? Mm. You know, why is, why is God not helping these nice, kind people? They're lovely people. You know, and why is this arrogant pig getting everything he wants? And the, the laws of manifestation absolutely explain that. Because the guy who's arrogant, he's not worrying about what might go wrong. He doesn't care. He's only focusing on what's going to go right. And he's already feeling he's got his new, you know, got his new Range Rover in the garage or whatever. Because he's such yeah. self-belief it's going to happen. Yeah, that he's going to happen. It's just a case of when, not if. Exactly. Yeah. And, and conversely, you know, the people where everything goes wrong, um, they worry about everything. They worry about what if all the time. Mm. And because they're normally empathetic people, they're always worried and putting themselves in other people's shoes and they're seeing all the downside yeah. of stuff and they're self-manifesting disaster. Yeah, so it's funny you should mention that because I had a day a few days ago where just everything was was going wrong. You know, I was watching my investment charts go down. My IBS was causing me a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. And I find myself thinking back, you know, I know so many arseholes around that wouldn't I was going to say that earlier yeah that wouldn't give you the time of day wouldn't give you you know a pound if you needed it and everything is completely their way you know these these people and then there's someone like like me who and I, I thought at the time you know surely I don't deserve this you know I've had depression and anxiety since I was 12 you know I've got no girlfriend I'm on my own I'm still living at home with my parents which isn't an issue because if I wasn't they'd, they'd go they'd drive each other mad um but you know and yet I'm, you know, I would give the the sheet off me back to anybody if they needed it, and still, I, I'd seem to be the one that's punished for it. You know, when these other arseholes just get it handed to them on a plate. You know, so I've been there recently, um, and I've been in a lot of pain, especially with the IBS recently. And I just think, surely, surely, I must have done something to warrant this in the past life or something, because it's just not fair. You know, and it put me into quite a bad, depressive kind of mindset. But I think that's that's the problem is when you get stuck in that mindset. Of course, as you say, the law of manifestation then takes over, 
and you get stuck in that spiral and it's very very difficult to picture anything yeah happening. how can you ignore it exactly and in your, if yeah, you're in a depressive hard. mindset you can't see any positives to come and you can't feel any positives to come so it almost feels like a self-degrading spiral of well then the whole universe is going to be against you for the rest of your life you know it's a bit like if you win the raffle or a scratch card or something and you go yes and then you win something else straight away yeah and conversely you get an unexpected bill through the door and you're like no <laughs> where's this come from yeah and then you get another one indeed you think, it's... God, how worse is my day gonna go today i know i mean even on a on a macro on a micro level you know i remember distinctly every time i used to play this this stupid game on the playstation the fifa which is notoriously bad for being unfair and I always remember, and I always wondered why, but every time I'd lose and I'd get really angry and start throwing pillows around, the rest of the day, everything would go wrong. For no reason. You'd, you'd stub your toe, things would fall off the table, you'd nudge your, your tea and it would splatter everywhere. Just for no reason. And it, it would only ever start once you get annoyed, once I got annoyed at playing that game. You know. And that's the interesting thing, really. In the Ask and It Shall Be Given book, there's a scale of where are you on this scale? And it's becoming mindful of your feelings at any given point is the key to this laws of manifestation. So right at the top is joy and bliss and happiness and all that stuff. And it goes gradually down into, you know, anger, depression, and worse and worse and worse as it goes down the scale. And it's like people who are depressed, if they start getting angry, society goes, oh, oh no, no, we don't like that. You know, so calm down, sit down, be quiet. It's an actual fact we should be encouraging it because it's a step up the scale mm. because they've gone from apathy to some sort of passion and emotion going on and therefore they're moving up the vibrational scale and being mindful of where you are on that scale because you've only got to get 51% of your day in the positive zone to tip the scales in your favour, mm. to get things to start manifesting your way. So being mindful of where you're on that scale is quite interesting. Dr. Wayne Dyer, I don't know if you've read any of his stuff. I, I've heard the name, but only on a passing. Fantastic. The poor fellow's dead now, but a wonderful, wonderful speaker. His last book he did is called Real Magic. Yes, that's right. And mm -hmm. he talks about a lot of things that made a lot of sense. That book, for me, changed my life. Because the ethos of it is what's most people's perception of the worst thing that's going to happen to you, the biggest thing you're frightened of, is death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the one thing that's absolutely 100% guaranteed. You know, no one makes it out alive. Life's a sexually transmitted disease. Mm -hmm. Once you accept that that is going to happen, and we all try to not think about it and put it away and all the rest of it. But once you say, well, actually, the one thing that is absolutely guaranteed is going to happen. And then he gives lots of examples in the book of life after death and proof of survival and things like that. Then once you accept that, it's absolutely 100% going to happen. Well, what's the worst that can happen is guaranteed. So what are you waiting for? Get on with it. Nothing yeah. really matters yeah. after that. You know, you're, you're born with nothing and you go with nothing. Mm. So what does it really matter? Mm. So the risk you take that stops us doing things and getting on and making decisions suddenly becomes irrelevant. Indeed. And it motivates you to say, yeah, exactly. What well, what the worst is going to happen is going to happen. So let's get on with it. Yes, yeah, so that that's a common argument used is that you know life is is impermanent and we're going to die. So that kind of brings the meaning to life. For me, I struggle to get to grips with that because my whole anxiety, which is health based, focuses on the fear of death. You know, I get a stomach ache and I my mind immediately jumps to stomach cancer or bowel cancer or something like that. Um, it's just how my mind works and it causes an anxiety attack which makes it all worse and it gets it just gets so convoluted but um i think the thing for me that always terrified me and the reason i started doing this kind of research is the idea of total annihilation for eternity which is you know a hell of a long time terrified me and so i started looking at it to try and understand you know if there must be more to it because otherwise i just think life would be just a completely sick joke you know, i go for all this yeah, what's the point yeah, there's no point is crap just to just to go and I, I struggle with the argument that it's the impermanence of life and the and the fact fact that there'll be total annihilation that gives life meaning because in that mindset you know i always use the example it doesn't matter if you're a mother Teresa or a hitler because ultimately the universe is going to experience total death 
you know so no matter how good or bad you make it for the future generations they're all going to die at some point as well so ultimately it'll be inconsequential yeah and, absolutely you know and i think this is why i think it's a shame that this isn't really the main focus of science to understand what happens after death because i think if if it if it was known that death is only of the physical and that our minds and our personalities and our consciousness and our, our relationships will continue and we'll see people that we've missed again especially i think that would bring so much more value to life mm. yeah Personally. it's true and it would take away so much anxiety and so much grief you know imagine the imagine the what, what it would do for the process of grief to know that it's a temporary separation yeah, well absolutely and that's where a lot of mediumship that you know people like carol green and myself do um when you're stood in front of a crowd of people and you're bringing through say the spirit of a child that's passed and the parents obviously grieving badly for that child for them to then give not just evidence that you know, the, the child is there and with you but to then give messages to say well that child was in your kitchen with you yesterday and you were doing this you know unequivocal proof that they were around you still mm. You know, it's a wonderful comfort for people to know that they've survived and they will see them again. Yeah. My um, my mum was very much like that with our, our little dog, Ty. And I, I was as well because Ty was, I mean, we had two little miniature schnauzers and you, you should never say that, you know, one is better than the other. But Ty was our special. You know, he, he had that soulmate connection to mum, especially. And I asked Carol to bring him through and she did. And she said, um, you often get this smell that comes up that kind of you recognize as him and i said yeah when he was yeah, when he was like, getting towards the end he used to you know he was incontinent and he'd, he'd pee himself and he'd have that urine smell but it was it was a nice smell to get even though it was a urine smell it was nice because it was thai you know and um we hadn't we hadn't smelt him for a year or, or so because we we'd moved house after we lost him because it was too painful and um since moving the house, we'd maybe smelt him once or twice in, in the two years. And she said, this was recently, this was only a couple of months ago that I had the reading with her. She said, he he said that you'll know it's him because he'll he'll send you that smell again so that you know it was him that was giving you these messages for sure. And it will happen within <laughs> the next two weeks. I never got it, but mum did on the last day of the two weeks. And that was pretty, pretty amazing. That's good evidence, isn't it? Good it proof. Is. It is, absolutely. I mean, the fact that, of course, Carol said that I'd get it, I think was just a misinterpretation, or not well, not necessarily, a, but a, a kind of a, a misjudgment that it would be for me, because Ty was mum's special one. So the message would have been much more important for her to get than me, per se, you know. And, that, you know, that was that was nice. That was nice, especially. I'll tell you, I'll give you another example of Ty coming through, Ty and Omi. After they died, foxes have always been my favourite animal. And I've, we'd never seen one. We lived in the same house for 25 years. Granted, we didn't go off out often at night, but we'd never seen one in 25 years. And I said to Ty and Omi, I said, send me a, a fox. I actually said, send me a tame fox that would kind of come up because I thought, you know, foxes aren't tame. If one comes up to me, that is incredibly unusual. And there's no other way it could be. I, I never got that. But after I asked for that, I saw three in three weeks. Just right <laughs> okay. in front of us. And that was, I've yeah. never seen one in 25 years of living in that house. I mean, me and mum would go out for walks at night after we lost them because it was painful to stay in the house. So granted, we'd gone out more at night, but three within three weeks, you know, two of them came within one week, days apart. And you think, Christ, you know, that that is a huge coincidence, you'd have to say. I mean, the depth of coincidence. And that sort of thing has has really brought me back to the the belief that they're still there in some form or another ah, absolutely i mean evidential mediumship as i term it you know proof beyond doubt mm. um when when you've done as many years of it <laughs> then it's no longer even a question you know because you've proven it to yourself mm. that many times i remember one one particular message really stands out i was working at a church in i think it was yate or chip in Salisbury. And um, I was drawn to this lady in the front row. And I said, right, I've got this chap here. And he shouted Manchester at me. Has anyone got relatives in Manchester? And she was the only lady that put her hand up. 
So I said, okay, I, th I thought I was with you. So then I saw this gentleman dressed, large, thick-set man dressed in a grey pinstripe suit and he had a hat on and he's smoking a big cigar and he had a big bushy moustache. And she said, that's my granddad, absolutely. So I said, okay. So I said, and then his face blurred for me like he was shaking his head side to side and that for me means dementia. So I said to her, did, did he pass with dementia? And she said, yes, he did. And then he reached around behind him and a little girl came from behind him with blonde ringlets and he was holding her hand and she was wearing a blue fairy outfit and she had a, a wand with a star on the end. So I described her and she said, yes, she was buried wearing that outfit. And I said, okay, but it's not your daughter, was it? And she said, no, it's my sister's. So I said, okay, your granddad's come through today and he's telling me that he's looking after her for you and he wants you to tell your sister. Mm. Now that's pretty evidential, describing the outfit <laughs> yeah. she was buried in yeah. and describing her and describing her granddad and describing her dementia. So things like that, you know, I've got hundreds of those. Mm. There. And yet people... For me, it's beyond doubt now. Indeed, There's yeah. no... And yet people will still say, well, you were obviously cold reading or you'd research these people or you had hidden microphones. Anything but to admit that there's something actually going on here, you know. Yeah, of course. And always, whenever I've posted anything in forums and said, what do you think about this? Always, you know, repeatedly, and I've said it a lot, but always I get this response. Well, like, why didn't they win the Randy Challenge? Are you aware of the Randy Challenge? Yeah, he's yeah. put a million dollars up, hasn't he? That's right, yeah. He's Is it still live? Is it still going? No, you know, he did pass now and, you know, not to speak ill of the dead, you know, he, he was very good at what he did. <laughs> Obviously, he became very well known, very rich, I'm sure, as a result of it. But one has to question the the, the genuineness of the of the challenge, you know. But, yeah, well, I'm sure I know people who would have won that. That's for mm, sure. Mm. But it's in America, isn't it? It, it was, yeah. I think that, I don't think the challenge is ongoing anymore, but. Yeah, that's, that's just so just as an example, that's always what I got. James Randy and the Randy Challenge proves that there's no such thing because nobody won it. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I mean, for me, everyone should do their own journey. Everyone should do their own research. Everyone should form their own beliefs. Mm. And we form our beliefs on experience, don't we? Yeah. People who've never experienced anything are never going to believe. Why would they? I totally get that. Yeah, indeed. And I think it's important to kind of differentiate the, the difference between kind of knowledge and belief. As you say, you know, after so many years, it's now a knowledge for you that we continue after death. And I think a good way to kind of think about that is, is if you imagine a belief as in, you know, going back to something I know about, you know, investments, you believe that this stock is going to go up in the future because you've done research on it and you believe it's going to. Whereas knowledge is, I know that if I jump out of this window, I'm going to fall to the ground. You know, it's a difference in quality between belief and knowledge. And I think what you're talking about is knowledge in the sense that you know you're going to survive death in the same way you know that if you throw something in the air, it's going to come back down again. Mm. And being an engineer, I questioned every step of the journey. I wanted proof. Um, I went to a circle, development circle in Stonehouse in Gloucestershire. And I'd only just joined and it was a group of people. And I didn't know any of them at all. And it was my turn to stand up and practice and see if I could give a message to someone. Um, and I said to this lady, uh, right, I've got a gentleman here, quite thick set. He's wearing a dark suit. He's got black, shiny hair and it goes down and it curls up behind his ear. And he's wearing one platform shoe. <laughs> and he stood in a garden and it's up north in Yorkshire or somewhere. And he's really into his gardening. And she went, that's my dad. Absolutely. 100%. One platform shoe, black, shiny hair, left his gardens in Yorkshire. 100%, that's my dad. I said, okay, now he's doing something weird. He's wagging his finger playfully, but a bit of a tell it off. And he's saying to me, you're going to falsify the school register. Now, I had no idea this woman was a teacher. She went spasmodic. <laughs> she absolutely went mental at me and gave me a real telling off and said, I've been a teacher for 25 years. I've never falsified the school register. I never will. Blah, 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 right? Yeah, You're wrong. Messenger. Yeah. So don't shoot the messenger. And the question I'd been asking to my spirit team at that point was, am I reading the person's memories or am I getting the information from spirit? Or am I just 
because I don't know if you know there's a difference between mediumship and being psychic. Yeah. Psychics read energy in people as mediums are getting messages from the spirit world. Yeah. So I wanted to know, am I reading the person? Am I just picking this up from their memories? And how do I tell the difference? So anyway, she went mental at me. And I was I was a little bit taken back and shocked, to be quite honest with you, with the hostility level. I think, you know, we're only practicing. I'm making it wrong. Who knows? So I went home, tail between my legs. Following week, I came back. She came rushing over to me. I thought, oh, God, she's going to have another go. And she said, I have to apologize to you. And I said, why is that? She said, the next day I went into school and the headmaster made me falsify the school register to include a student teacher so we get the funding for him for next year. Yeah. Yeah. She said, so I'm so sorry you were right. But it answered my question. Indeed. I couldn't have yeah. been reading her because she didn't know it yet. No, that's right. The only way you could have been reading something that wasn't from spirit was if you were, say, tapping into the so-called Akashic Records or something like that, which is yeah. kind of a, a debate, isn't it, between uh, in mediumship. That's it? another belief structure altogether. Yeah, indeed, indeed. It is, it's a, it is a big rabbit hole, all this sort of stuff, because, again, you know, once you start, you realise how deep everything regarding energy and spiritual realities go. And of course, they've never been touched by anything you're taught in school regarding science and psychology. So it's this whole new kind of worldview that you have to understand and whole philosophies and you know, whole sciences as well that just have never been. Yeah, we have, uh, in my trance circle, we connect with a collective group of spirits and they call themselves the collective. And they have a spokesperson that comes through first um, called Bernard. And we have some absolutely fascinating questions and answer sessions that we record. That at some point I will make them into a book because some of the information that we've had is mind blowing, things you'd never even think of. Mm. Um, for example, I'll give you a quick example of that. Uh, we were talking one day about different vibrational levels if we've all got this energy that we emit with vibrational frequency that's our auric field you know and we we read other people's auric fields you know like, and that's the reasons why some people you take an instant warm to and some people you dislike without ever speaking to them because your energy fields are either the same or different mm. and if they're very different you'll take this oh stay away i don't like you attitude and all that kind of stuff so we said so as the higher vibrational creatures that some people might call angels and they said yes there are and then they said there's also lower vibrational creatures such as jinns and elementals which i think are mentioned in the bible not sure but yes just as they're higher they're lower they're more primitive more basic and they're on a different dimension to you and then they explained about how this vibrational energy you have as a spirit slows down when you inhabit a human body a little bit like putting a load on a vacuum cleaner you hear the motor slow down and when you die it speeds up again and it goes out of our visual spectrum a bit like tuning the radio up to the next station mm -hmm. you can no longer hear the previous station so the people here can no longer see the spirits because they increase their vibrational energy and that in essence is what a medium is someone who's able to increase their vibrational energy and the spirit world will decrease their vibrational energy so you can kind of meet in the middle and communicate um, which is quite an interesting one. Uh, excuse me one second. I'll call you back. <laughs> Phone's going non-stop, typical. Um, where am I going with this? Uh, sorry, I've lost my thread and my phone was going. What were you just saying before this? Um, we were saying about um, how the... You're talking about how spirit communicates by lowering their vibrational level and, and raising yours to meet in the middle. Yeah. yeah. And what they were saying... Um, was that your guide, your guardian angel, whatever you want to call it, is with you for the whole journey. Different guides come in and go for different experiences in your life. Um, we were talking about the Akashic Records, weren't we, and predetermined whether your oh, the conversations we've had is that your whole life's journey you plan before you come here. So you have total free will to plan it, but once you're here, you're on a computer program in effect is that is that like the major uh the major occasions in your life that you've the major milestones yeah but there is flexibility yeah they described it like being inside a sausage balloon where the beginning and the end of the sausage balloons are set points 
and you can deviate off inside the balloon and stretch it in the wrong direction. But you'll get this sense that things are wrong and you'll gradually get pulled back to complete whatever milestone step it is. So the things that are meant for you will happen is kind of the message. Whether you're guardian angel, your guide, whatever. I mean, how many times have you, I don't know, gone to overtake on a bend or something and you suddenly get this big feeling of, oh, no, mm. and you don't. Mm. And then a big lorry comes around the corner and you would have hit it kind of thing. We've all had those type of experiences. And they say that's your your guide, your guardian angel communicating with you. Mm. And they went on to further explain that um, to warn you of an impending danger, they would grab a lower vibrational creature and stand it in your auric field. So you suddenly get a great sense of sinking. As your energy lowers, you suddenly get this feeling of dread, mm. this pulling sensation. And it's a bit like electricity. You know, if you put two voltages together, they try to even each other out, or they'll try and find a way to earth if you stick an earth in the way. It always tries to even out a bit, a bit like water in two buckets. Or yeah. and if you put a pipe between the two, we'll quickly do that, won't they? Level, yeah. So if they put a lower vibrational creature in your vibrational energy, it will try to balance out the laws of physics. And that will give you this huge sinking feeling of dread. And they do that to warn you of an impending danger. Mm, and to prevent you from doing whatever would put you in that danger. Yeah, to give you that, that oh, God, something's wrong. Yeah. So information like that I find fascinating that's coming in from other places and other worlds. Yeah, it is. it really is a whole other science, isn't it? Separate from ours. Yeah. yeah. And you could say, you know, you've just made it up, Peter. You know, it's your imagination talking. But it's things that I would never have thought of. No, indeed. And that's what I find quite fascinating with the communication with this collective group. Yeah. And of course, it's not only you that have said these kinds of things. They, these are, you know, common things that, I mean I've never heard about the putting a negative entity in your aura before I've never heard that but I have heard other things you're saying about changing the vibrational levels in order to communicate I've heard that from other communicators you know in the, in the past I can't remember who but I think Mario Bacci and people like that mentioned all that sort of thing so it's the same message you're getting through the same information yeah which is evidence in, in and of itself and I'm a big believer in um how we are influenced from the spirit, apart from speaking German, we're influenced as a society as well. If you look at some of the inventions that have happened around the world, like take the diesel engine, Rudolf Diesel is uh, attributed with inventing the diesel engine uh, in Germany or Austria, I can't remember which. Um, but simultaneously in South America, someone also invented a diesel engine absolutely at the same time. Hmm. So it's like sometimes some things are meant to be and it's going to get through one way or another. Yeah. I find that quite fascinating as well. Mm. Kind of the, these synchronicities. I mean, synchronicity is a whole other thing, isn't it? But yeah, we could go it on for hours. <laughs> yeah. And just as people channel artwork psychically and can paint, there's a lady. Oh, oh, I can't remember her name. Is this her with the two hands and two feet? Yeah, she paints yeah. simultaneously. Oh, you yeah. know about that? I know about that. Uh, yeah. Her guide's Leonardo da Vinci, and she paints simultaneously mm. two different faces whilst not even looking at the paper and talking to the audience. That's right. Yeah, I've seen that. That's pretty amazing. My blood, so. Yeah, it is. Oh, well, I suppose I better let you go for now, Pete. Maybe we can dive into some other, some other subjects of these on a separate yeah, call got, at some point. I've got some very interesting stories if you want to do some more. Yeah, that'd be great. But for now, I'll, I'll let you go because we've reached an hour. But yeah, thanks for coming on. If you want to let us know where everybody can find you or contact you. Uh, yeah, my website is spirituallytalking.com. Spirituallytalking.com. 